Okay, folks, so we've explored uh, the rate law, we've explored the integrated rate law, and we've looked at a few different ways to determine what the order of a reaction is, depending on what sort of data you have at your disposal. And we talked about that in the first four video tutorials for this kinetics topic. In, in this video, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of half-life, and you can see that uh, we've just got a bit of a summary slide of our different integrated rate laws for zero, first and second order reactions. I've expressed the integrated rate laws here. We can uh, see which of these um, formulations, if you like, will give us a linear plot. So for a zero order reaction, if you plot the concentration by time, it'll give you a straight line. If you do that for first order, you'll get an exponential curve. You actually have to plot the log of the absorbance by time to get a straight line. And for second order, it's 1 over, um, keep saying absorbance because it's an A, I mean concentration, 1 over the concentration versus time to give us uh, uh, a linear plot. It's a nice way of checking to see what the order of your reaction is. And I've summarised what the slope and the intercept for those linear plots might be. We've also got this idea of half-life though, and you can see that the expression for the half-life, in other words, the amount of time for something to have halved its concentration as the reaction proceeds. It's actually different depending on the order of the reaction. And you can see that for zero and second order reactions, the concentration term appears in that equation. For a first order reaction, you can see that, and I'll just get my inking to make it abundantly clear. Uh, what are the tip pen we've got right. This equation, here's the half-life for a first order reaction. You can see that the concentration doesn't even appear in that equation. So obviously the half-life for a first order decay or first order reaction actually has nothing to do with the concentration. So it could be very low concentrations, could be very high concentrations. You'll get the same sort of kinetics. And the classic example is radioactive decay. <clears throat> Radioactivity is the emission of a particle or a photon that results in the spontaneous decomposition of an unstable nucleus. And you can get things like alpha particles, beta particles, gamma radiation being emitted during these, these events. One of the classic cases there, uranium. Uh, the rate of radioactive decay is an intrinsic property of each isotope. It's independent of the chemical and physical form of the radioactive isotope or the temperature. Radioactive decay is first order process. The half-life for first order decay, as we saw on the first slide, was equal to the log of 2 divided by the rate constant. In other words, it's got nothing to do with concentration, but it's everything to do with the rate constant. And so let me express this in a different way. If you know what the half-life is, for a particular decay, then you should be able to work out the rate, rate constant and vice versa. So the half-life is used to describe the radioactive decay of different isotopes. And you can see here we've got iodine-131, has a half-life of eight days. So after the first eight days, you might go from 100% uh, uh, from down to 50%, but that doesn't mean within another eight days you've gone down to 0%. You actually go from 50 to uh, 25, to 12 and a half, and so on. So you've probably heard of carbon-14 dating before. Uh, it's the most common method for measuring the age of you know, ancient uh, biological objects and, and so on. The carbon-14 isotope create, is created in the upper regions of the Earth's atmosphere. It reacts with atmospheric oxygen or ozone to form carbon dioxide which doesn't have carbon-12, but carbon-14. And as hopefully you guys know, the CO2 uh, that plants use as a carbon source to, to build those plants and build those leaves and stems and tree trunks and so on, um, uh, you know, gets incorporated into those uh, materials. And, uh, and, and, and the amount of uh, <clears throat> carbon-14 in a living creature it should be proportional to the isotopic ratio of, of carbon-14 in the atmosphere as well, in the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. 
But when animals and plants die, the carbon-14 in its tissue decays to nitrogen-14, and there's also this beta emission. Because the species is not alive anymore, it's not constantly replenishing its carbon source from, from the natural abundance of carbon in the, uh, in the atmosphere. And so what you get is a slow decay of the amount of carbon-14 in, uh, in, in a species which is no longer alive. Anyway, we can use this to advantage. And the reason is pretty much because we actually know the half-life of carbon-14 pretty well. It's about 5,700 years. So by comparing the ratio of some old species with that for living plants, it actually allows the calculation of the age of that sample. So we have a sample problem here, uh, sort of a carbon dating problem. An archaeological sample has been submitted for carbon-14 dating, and you can use a beta counter to measure the amount of uh, disintegrations, these sort of radioactive disintegrations. And so the beta counter measures uh, 0.96 disintegrations per minute per gram. A contemporary living sample of the same material reads 15.3 disintegrations per minute per gram. So you might be thinking, uh, that's a pretty weird kind of unit. The good news is, is these units in our calculations effectively, effectively cancel with each other. So it doesn't really matter what the, uh, what the units are, they're going to cancel so we can kind of ignore them. Question, how old is the ancient sample? Well, we know what the half-life equation is for first order decay, it equals this. Um, but to solve this problem, what we really need to solve is k. So if we rearrange that equation, we should actually get the log of 2 divided by the half-life. And of course, log of 2 is just a constant. And from the previous slide, we know that uh, k, um, sorry, that the um, Half-life is, uh, yeah, that's right, the half-life is 5,700 years. Okay, so let's, um, let's plug that in and we get a value of uh, 1.22 times 10 to the minus 4. And this is years to the minus 1. Okay, I know that's different to the units that we have for disintegrations, but we should see that that's not going to matter when we get to the next step of the calculation. Anyway, now that we have a value for k, we can actually manipulate the first order integrated rate law, which looks whoops, a little bit like this. To solve the problem. Because what we have is, if you like, the initial concentration, the final concentration, we've got the rate constant. So as long as we can just rearrange this equation, so if I do a little rearrangement, I'm probably going to get something which looks, uh, yeah, I guess something like this, right? Um, uh, divided by k. Well, we've got all these values, right? We've got... Uh, the log of 15.3 minus the log of 0.96 and we divide that by k which we worked out in the previous part of the question and you can see that because we're using a log our units on the top effectively cancel for those that forget their log maths I'll get you to revise that in your own time but what's nice is we now have years to the minus one on the lower side of our equation. So that should give us a, uh, a final unit back into years, which is what we want. So what have we got here? 22,700 years. That's how old our radioactive sample is. All right, guys, that's it for now. I'll see you in the next video tutorial to talk about the Arrhenius equation.